Okay, so welcome back. So we're going to start by uh, doing some review, and we're going to talk about uh, test sets, training sets, validation sets, and OOB. Um, something we haven't covered yet, but uh, we will cover in more detail later, is also cross-validation, but I'm going to talk about that as well. Right? So we have a data set with a bunch of rows in it. And we've got some dependent variable. And so what's the difference between like machine learning and kind of pretty much any other kind of work? The, the, the difference is that in machine learning, the thing we care about is the generalization accuracy or the generalization error, where else in like pretty much everything else, all we care about is is how well we kind of map to the observations full stop. And so this this thing about generalization is the key unique piece of, of machine learning. And so if we want to know whether we're good, doing a good job of machine learning, we need to do, know whether we're doing a good job of generalizing. If we don't know that, we know nothing. Right? Um, yeah. By generalizing, do you mean like scaling, being able to scale larger data sets? Or you no, I, I don't mean scaling at all. So sc scaling is an important thing in many, many areas. It's like, okay, we've got something that works uh, on on my computer with 10,000 items. I now need to work make it work on 10,000 items per second or something. So scaling is important, um, but not just for machine learning, for, for just about everything we put in production. Generalization is where I say, okay, here is a model that can predict cats from dogs. I've looked at five pictures of cats, five pictures of dogs, and I've built a model that is perfect. And then I look at a different set of five cats and dogs, and it gets them all wrong. So in that case, what it learnt was not the difference between a cat and a dog, but it learnt what those five exact cats look like and those five exact dogs look like. Or I've built a model of predicting uh, grocery sales for a particular product, so for toilet rolls uh, in New Jersey last month. Um, and then I go and put it into production, and it scales great. In other words, it, it has a great latency, I don't have a high CPU load, uh, but it fails to predict anything well other than uh, toilet rolls in New Jersey. And it also it turns out it only did it well for last month, not for next month. So these are all generalization failures. So um, the most common way that people check for the ability to generalize is to uh, create a random sample. So they'll grab a few rows at random and pull it out into a test set. And then they'll build all of their models on the rest of the rows. And then when they're finished, they'll check the, the accuracy they got on there. So the rest of the rows are called the training set, everything else. Everything else we could call the training set. And so at the end of their modeling process on the training set, they got an accuracy of 99% at predicting cats from dogs. At the very end, they check it against a test set to make sure that the model really does generalize. Now the problem is, what if it doesn't, right? So okay, well I could go back and change some hyperparameters, do some data augmentation, whatever else, try to create a more generalizable model, and then I'll go back again after doing all that and check, and it's still no good. Right? And I'll keep doing this again and again until eventually, after 50 attempts, it does generalize. But does it really generalize? Because maybe all I've done is accidentally found this one which happens to work just for that test set, because I've tried 50 different things, right? And so if I've got something which is like right coincidentally 0.05% of the time, then I'm very likely to accidentally get a good result. So what we generally do is we put aside a second data set. I've got a couple more of these and put these aside into a validation set. Validation set, right? And then everything that's not in the validation 
test is now training and so what we do is we train a model check it against the validation to see if it generalizes Do that a few times and then when we finally got something where we're like, okay We think this generalizes successfully based on the validation set and then at the end of the project we check it against the test set uh, Yeah uh, So basically by making this two-layer test set validation set if it gets one right the other one wrong you kind of double checking your errors kind of like that. It's checking that we haven't overfit to the validation set. So if we're using the validation set again and again, then we could end up not coming up with a generalizable set of hyperparameters, but a set of hyperparameters that just so happen to work on the training set and the validation set. So, so if we try 50 different models um, against the validation set, and then at the end of all that, we then check that against the test set, And it still generalizes well, then we're kind of going to say, okay, that's good. We've actually come up with a generalizable model. If it doesn't, then that's going to say, okay, we've actually now overfit to the validation set. At which point you're kind of in trouble, right? Because you don't, you know, you don't have anything left behind, right? So the idea is to use effective techniques during the modeling so that so that doesn't happen, right? But but if it's going to happen, you want to find out about it. Like you need that test set to be there because otherwise when you put it in production and Then it turns out that it doesn't generalize that would be a really bad outcome, right? You end up with less people clicking on your ads or selling less of your products or Providing car insurance to very risky vehicles or whatever So uh, just to make sure do you need to ever check if the validation set and the test set is, is coherent or you just keep test set coherent? So if you've done what I've just done here, which is to randomly sample, there's no particular reason to check as long as they're as long as they're big enough, right? But we're going to come back to your question uh, in a different context in just a moment. Um, now, another trick we've learned for random forests is a way of um, not needing a validation set. Uh, and the way that we learned was to use instead use the OOB. Error or the OOB score and so this idea was to say well every time we train a tree in a random forest There's a bunch of observations that are held out anyway because that's how we get some of the randomness and so let's Calculate our score for each tree based on those held out samples and therefore the forest by averaging the trees that that each row was not part of training Okay um, And so the OOB score gives us something which is pretty similar to the validation score, uh, but on average it's a little less good. Can anybody either remember or figure out why on average it's a little less good? Quite a subtle one. Can I give it to Chen Shi? I'm not sure, but uh, is it because you are treating, like you are doing every Kind of probe uh, pre-processing on your test tag, and so the OB score is reflecting the performance on testing set. No, so the OB score is not using the test set at all. The OB oh, no, score is using set. the held out rows in the training set yeah, yeah. for each tree. So I mean, the um, you are basically testing each tree on some data from the training set. Yes. So you are you have the potential of overfitting the training set. Um, I sh it shouldn't cause overfitting because each one is looking at a held out sample, so it's not an overfitting issue. It's quite a subtle issue. Ernest, do you want to have a try? Uh, aren't the samples from OOB um, bootstrap samples? They are. And so then uh, you're never going to, I mean, on average, they only grab 63% of right. the chance. So on average, the OOB is 1 minus 63%. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And so what's the issue? So then if you're not so why would the score be lower than the validation score? Then that average? implies that you're leaving sort of like a black hole in the data that there's like data points You're never going to sample and they're not going to be represented by the model. Ah, No, that's not true though because each tree is looking at a different set, right? So the OLB so like we've got like I don't know dozens of models, right? And in each one there's a different set of rows Which which happen to be held out Right And so when we calculate the OOB score for like let's say row three We say okay row three is in this tree this tree and that's it And so we calculate 
the prediction on that tree and for that tree and we'd average those two predictions and so with enough trees you know each one has a 30 or so percent chance sorry 40 or so percent chance that the row is in that tree so if you have 50 trees it's almost certain that every row is going to be mentioned somewhere did you have an idea Karim? With validation set, we can use the whole forest to make the predictions, but here we cannot use the whole forest, so mm -hmm. we cannot exactly see. Exactly. So every best. row is going to be using a subset of the trees to make its prediction. And with less trees, we know we get a less accurate prediction. So that's like, that's a subtle one, right? And if you didn't get it, have a think during the week until you understand why this is because it's a really interesting test of your understanding of random forests of like why is OOB score on average less good than your validation score they're both using random sub random held out subsets anyway it's generally close enough right so why have a validation set at all um, when you're using random forest um, if it's a randomly chosen validation set, it's not strictly speaking necessary, but you know you've got like four levels of things to test, right? So you could like test on the OOB, when that's working well you can test on the validation set, you know, and hopefully by the time you check against the test set um, there's going to be no surprises, so that would be one good reason. Then um, what Kaggle do, the way they do this is kind of clever, what Kaggle do is they split the test set into two pieces, a public and a private. And they don't tell you which is which. So you submit your predictions to Kaggle, and then a random 30% of those are used to tell you the leaderboard score. But then, at the end of the competition, that gets thrown away, and they use the other 70% to calculate your real score. So what that's doing is that you're making sure that you're not like continually using that feedback from the leaderboard to figure out some set of hyperparameters that happens to do well on the public, but actually doesn't generalize. Okay, so it's a great test. Like this is one of the reasons why it's good uh, practice to use Kaggle, because at the end of a competition, at some point this will happen to you, and you'll drop a hundred places on the leaderboard the last day of the competition when they use the private test set, and it's like, oh, okay, that's what it feels like to overfit. And it's much better to practice and get that sense there than it is to do it. In a company where there's hundreds of millions of dollars on the line. Um, okay, so this is like the easiest possible situation where you're able to use a random sample for your validation set. Why might I not be able to use a random sample for my validation set? I'll pass it to Taylor. Um, in the case of something where we're forecasting, we can't randomly sample because we need to maintain the uh, temporal ordering. Go on. Why is that? Um, because it doesn't it doesn't make sense. So in, in the case of like an ARMA model, um, I, I can't use like I can't pull out random rows because there's I'm, I'm thinking that there's like a certain dependency or I'm, I'm I'm trying to model a certain dependency that relies on like a specific lag term. If I randomly sample those things, then that lag term isn't there for me to use. Okay, so it could be like a, a, a technical modeling issue that like I, I'm using a model that relies on like yesterday, the day before, and the day before that, and if I've randomly removed some things I don't have yesterday, and my model might just fail. Okay, that's true, but there's a more fundamental issue. Do you want to pass it to Tyler? Um, it's a really good point. Um, although, you know, in general, we're going to try to build models that are not that are more resilient than that. Particularly with, um, uh, yeah, t temporal order, uh, we expect things that are close by in time to be related to things close to them. Mm -hmm. So we, ex so, uh, so if we destroy the order, yeah. like if if we destroy the order, we really aren't going to be able to use that this time is close to this other time. Um, I don't think that's true because uh, we can pull out a random sample for our validation set and still keep everything nicely ordered. Well, so we would like to is... predict yeah, things in the future, which we would require uh, as much data close to the end of our 
Okay, that's true. I mean, we, we could be like limiting the amount of data that we have by taking some of it out. Um, but my claim is stronger. My claim is that by using a random validation set, we could get totally the wrong idea about our model. Karim, do you want to have a try? So if our data is imbalanced, for example, we can, if you are randomly sampling it, we can only have one class in our validation set. So our fitted model may be... That's true as well. So maybe you're trying to predict in a medical situation who's going to die of lung cancer, and that's only one out of a hundred people, and we pick out a validation set that we accidentally have nobody that died of lung cancer. Uh, that's also true. These are all good niche examples. But none of them quite say like why could the validation set just be plain wrong? Like give you a totally inaccurate idea of whether this is going to generalize. Uh, and so let's talk about um, and the closest is 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 what Tyler was saying about time closeness in time. The important thing to remember is when you build a model, you're always you always have a systematic error which is that you're going to use the model at a later time than the time that you built it, right? Like you're going to put it into production, by which time the world is different to the world that you're in now. And even when you're building the model, you're using data which is older than today anyway, right? So there's some lag between the data that you're building it on and the data that it's going to be actually be used on in real life. And a lot of the time, if not most of the time, that matters. Right, so if we're doing stuff in like predicting who's going to buy toilet paper in New Jersey, and it takes us two weeks to put it in production, and we did it using data from the last couple of years, then by that time, you know things may look very different, right? And particularly our validation set—if we randomly sampled it, right—and it was like from a four-year period, then the vast majority of that data is going to be over a year old. Right, and it may be that the toilet buying habits of folks in New Jersey may have dramatically shifted. Maybe they've got a terrible recession there now, and they can't afford uh, high quality toilet paper anymore. Um, or maybe they, you know their paper making industry has gone through the roof, and suddenly you know they could, they're buying lots more toilet paper because it's so cheap, or whatever. Right, so. The world changes, and therefore, if you use a random sample for your validation set, then you're actually checking how good are you at predicting things that are totally obsolete now. Right? How good are you at predicting things that happened four years ago? That's not interesting. Okay. So what we want to do in practice, anytime there's some temporal piece, is to instead say, assuming that we've ordered it. By time, right? So this is old, and this is new. That's our validation set. Okay. Or if we, you know, I suppose actually do it properly. That's our validation set. That's our test set. Make sense, right? So here's our training set. And we use that, and we try and build a model that still works on stuff that's later in time than anything the model was built on. And so we're not just testing generalization in some kind of abstract sense, but in a very sp specific time sense, which is it generalizes to the future. Could you pass it to Suraj, please? Uh, so when we are as, as you said, Could you lift it up and as that? you said, there is some temporal ordering in the data. So in that case, is it wise to take the entire old data for training or only a few recent data set? For of validation, data? test, or training? No, I'm talking about training. Training. Yeah, that's a whole other question, right? So um, how do you, how do you get the validation set to be good? So I build a, a random forest on all the training data. It looks good on the training data. It looks good on the OOB, right? And this is actually a really good reason to have OOB. If it looks good on the OOB, then it means you're not overfitting in a statistical sense, right? Like it's 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 working well on a random sample. But then it looks bad on the validation set, 
So what happened? Well, what happened was that you you somehow failed to predict the future. You only predicted the past. And so Suraj had an idea about how we could fix that. Would be okay. Well, maybe we should just train. So like maybe we shouldn't use the whole training set. We should try a recent period only. And now you know on the downside. We're now using less data, so we can create less rich models. On the upside, it's it's more up-to-date data, uh, and this is something you have to play around with. Most um, machine learning functions have the ability to provide a, a weight that is given to each row. So, for example, with a random forest, rather than bootstrapping at random, you could have a weight on every row and randomly pick that row with some probability, right? And we could like say. Here's our like probability. We could like pick a curve that looks like that, so that the most recent rows have a higher probability of being selected. Uh, that can work really well. Um, yeah, it's it, it's something that you have to try, and and if you don't have a validation set that represents the future compared to what you're training on, you have no way to know which of your techniques are, are working. How do you make the compromise between? Amount of data versus recency of data. Um, so what I tend to do is is when I have this kind of temporal issue, which is probably most of the time, um, once I have something that's working well on the validation set, I wouldn't then go and just use that model on the test set because the thing that I've trained on is now like, much, you know, the test set is much more in the future compared to the training set. So I would then replicate. Building that model again, but this time I would combine the training and validation sets together, okay, and and retrain the model. And at that point, you've got no way to to test against a validation set, so you have to make sure you have a reproducible script or notebook that does exactly the same steps in exactly the same ways. Um, because if you get something wrong, then you're going to find on the test set that you've you've got a problem. So, so what what I do in practice is I need to know is my validation set a, a, a truly representative of the test set. So what I do is I build five models on the training set, I build five models on the training set, and I try to have them kind of vary in how good I think they are, right? And then, and then I score them, my five models, on the validation set, right? And then I also score them on the test set, right? So I'm not cheating, so I'm not using any feedback from the test set to change my hyperparameters. I'm only using it for this one thing, which is to check my validation set. So I get my five scores from the test set, and then I check that they fall in a line. Okay, and if they don't, then you're not going to get good enough feedback from the validation set. So keep doing that process until you're getting a line, and that can be quite tricky, right? Sometimes the the test set, um, you know, trying to create something that's as similar to the real world outcome as possible, it's it's, it's difficult, right? And when you're kind of in the real world, the same is true of creating the test set. Like the test set. Has to be as close to production as possible. So, like, what's the actual mix of customers that are going to be using this? How much time is there actually going to be between when you build the model and when you put it in production? How often are you going to be able to refresh the model? These are all the things to think about when you build that test set. Okay, uh, let's do that first. So, you want to say that first, make five models on the training data, yeah. and then till you get a straight line relationship. Change your validation and test set. You can't really change the test set generally. So this is assuming that the test set's given. The change change the validation set. So if you start with a random sample validation set and then it's all over the place and you realize, oh, I should have picked the last two months, um, and then you pick the last two months, and it's still all over the place, and you realize, oh, I should have picked it so that's also from the first of the month to the fifteenth of the month, and you know, keep going until changing your validation set until you found a validation set which is. Indicative of your test set results. Uh, so the five models, like you would start maybe like just 
the random data and then average and like just make it better or yeah I mean, yeah 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 maybe a, a exactly a maybe a kind of five like not terrible ones but you want some variety and you also particularly want some variety in like how well they might generalize through time so one that was trained on the whole training set one that was trained on the last two weeks one that was trained on the last six weeks one which used uh, you know lots and lots of columns and might overfit a bit more yeah so you kind of want to get a sense of like oh if my validation set fails to generalize temporarily I'd want to see that if it fails to generalize statistically I'd want to see that sorry can you explain in a bit more detail what you mean by change your validation set so it indicates the test set like what does that look like um, so uh, so let's take the groceries competition where we're trying to predict um, the next two weeks of grocery sales. So possible validation sets that uh, Terence and I played with was um, a random sample, um, the last month of data, uh, the last two weeks of data, uh, and the other one we tried was uh, same uh, day range, one month earlier. So the, the test set in this competition was the 1st to the 15th of August. Sorry, the 15th, maybe the 15th to the 30th of August. So we tried like a random sample of four years. We tried um, uh, the 15th of July to the 15th of August. We tried the 1st of August to the 15th of August. And we tried the 15th of July to the 30th of July. And so there were four different validation sets we tried. And so with random, you know, our kind of results were all over the place. With last month, you know, they were like not bad but not great. The last two weeks there was a couple that didn't look good, but on the whole they were good. And same day range of a month earlier, they got a basically perfect line. So that's the part I'm talking about right there. What exactly are you comparing it to from the test set? I just kind of confused what you're creating that graph off of. So for each of those, uh, so for each of my, uh, so I build five models, right? So there might be like, uh, just predict the average, do some kind of simple group mean of the whole data set, do some group mean of the last month of the data set, build a random forest of the whole thing, build a random forest in the last two weeks. On each of those, I calculate the validation score, and then I retrain the model on the whole training set and calculate the same thing on the test set. And so each of these points now tells me how well did it go in the validation set, how well did it go in the test set. And so if the validation set is useful, we would say every time the validation set improves, the test set should also score should also improve. Yeah. So you just said ray train. Do you mean ray train the model on training and validation set? Yeah, that was a step I was talking about here. So once I've got the validation score based on just the training set. And then retrain it on the train and validation and check against test. Right. Just to make sure. Somebody else? So, just to clarify, uh, by test set, you mean uh, submitting it to Kaggle and then checking the score? If it's Kaggle, then your test set is Kaggle's leaderboard. Okay. Uh, in the real world, the test set is this third data set that you put aside and it's that third data set that having it reflect real world production differences is the most important step in a machine learning project why is it the most important step because if you screw up everything else but you don't screw up that you'll know you've screwed up right like if you've got a good test set then you'll know you screwed up because you screwed up something else and you tested it and it didn't work out and it's like okay you're not going to destroy the company right if you screwed up creating the test set that would be awful right because then you don't know if you've made a mistake right you, you try to build a model you test it on the test set it looks good but the test set was not indicative of real world uh, environment so you don't actually know if you're going to destroy the company Right? Now, hopefully, you've got ways to put things into production gradually, so you won't actually destroy the company, but you'll at least destroy your reputation at work, right? It's like, oh, Jeremy tried to put this thing into production, and in the first week, the cohort we tried it on, their sales halved, and we're never going to give Jeremy a machine learning job again, right? But if Jeremy had used a proper test set, then like he would have known, uh-oh, 
this is like half as good as my validation set said it would be I'll keep trying right and now I'm not going to get in any trouble I was actually like oh Jeremy's awesome he identifies ahead of time when there's going to be a generalization problem uh, okay so this is like this is something that kind of everybody talks about a little bit in machine learning classes, but often it kind of stops at the point where you learn that there's a thing in sklearn called make test train split and it returns these things and off you go, right? But the fact that like or here's the cross validation function, right? So the fact that these things always give you random samples tells you that like much if not most of the time you shouldn't be using them. Uh, the fact that random forest gives you an OOB for free, it's useful, but it only tells you that this generalizes in a statistical sense, not in a practical sense, right? So then finally, there's cross-validation, right? Which outside of class you guys have been talking about a lot, which makes me feel somebody's been overemphasizing the value of this technique. So I'll explain what cross-validation is, uh, and then I'll explain why you probably shouldn't be using it most of the time. So cross-validation says, let's not just pull out one validation set, but let's pull out five, say. So let's assume that we're going to randomly shuffle the data first. Right? This is critical. Right? We first randomly shuffle the data. And then we're going to split it into five groups. And then for model number one, we'll call this the validation set, and we'll call this the training set. Okay? And we'll train, and we'll check against the validation, and we'll get some RMSE, R squared, whatever. And then we'll throw that away, and we'll call this the validation set, and we'll call this The training set. And we'll get another score. Okay? We'll do that five times. And then we'll take the average. Okay, so that's a cross validation average accuracy. So who can tell me like a benefit of using cross validation over a the kind of standard validation set I talked about before? Uh, could you pass it to Fung? Uh, if you have a small data set, then uh, course validation will make use of the data you have. Yeah, you can use all of the data. You don't have to put anything aside. And you kind of get a little benefit as well in that like, you've now got five models that you could ensemble together, each one of used, which used 80% of the data, so you know sometimes that ensembling can be helpful. Um, um, Fung, could you tell me like what are, what could be some reasons that you wouldn't use cross validation? Uh, we have enough data, so we don't not want uh, the validation set to be included in the uh, model training set, uh, process uh, to to like to to pollute like like the, the model. Okay, yeah, I'm not sure that cross validation is necessarily polluting the model. What would be a key like downside of cross validation? But like for deep learning, if you have learned the pictures, and uh, the neural network will know the pictures, and it's more likely to predict it less than right. So, I guess sure. But if we if we put aside some data each time in the cross validation, can you pass that to Suraj? I'm 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 not so worried about. Like I don't think there's like one of these validation sets is more statistically accurate. Uh, yes, Suraj. I'm not mistaken. Will we be all fitting the data? Like, if you are trying to. I think that's what Fung was worried about. I don't see why that would happen. Like, each time we're fitting a model, just behind you, each time we're fitting a model, we are absolutely holding out 20% of the sample. Right? So, yes, the five models between them have seen all of the data, but, but it's kind of like a random forest. And in fact, it's a lot like a random forest. Each model has only been trained on a subset of the data. 
Yes, Nishant. Say if it is like a large data set, like it will take a lot of time. Oh, yes, exactly. Right? So we have to fit five models rather than one. So here's a key downside. Number one uh, is time. And so if we're doing deep learning and it takes a day to run, suddenly it now takes five days or we need five GPUs. Uh, okay, what about my earlier issues about validation sets? Do you want to pass it over there? What's your name? Jose. Jose, yes. Um, so if you had like temporal data, wouldn't you be, like by shuffling, wouldn't you be breaking that relation? Uh, well, we could unshuffle it afterwards. We could reorder it, like we could shuffle, get the training set out, and then sort it by time. Like and like, there's presumably there's a date column there, so I don't think I don't think it's going to stop us from building a model. Did you have uh, Ernest? Um, with cross validation, you're building five even validation sets, and if there is some sort of structure that you're trying to capture in your validation set to mirror your test set. You're, you're essentially just throwing that a chance to construct that uh, yourself. Right. I, I, I think you're going to say that. I think you said the same thing as I'm going to say, which is which is that our earlier concerns about why random validation sets are a problem are entirely relevant here. All these validation sets are random. So if a random validation set is not appropriate for your problem, most likely because, for example, of temporal issues, then None of these four validation set, five validation sets are any good. They're all random, right? And so if you have temporal data like we did here, there's no way to do cross-validation really, or like probably no good way to do cross-validation. I, I mean, you want to have this, your validation set be as close to the test set as possible, and so you can't do that by randomly sampling different things. So. Um, so as Fung said, you may well not need uh, uh, to do cross-validation because most of the time in the real world we, we don't really have that little data, right? Unless your data is based on some very, very expensive labeling process or some experiments that take a, cost a lot to run or whatever, but nowadays that's data scientists are not very often doing that kind of work. Some are, in which case this is an issue, but most of us aren't. So we probably don't need to. As Nishan said, if we do do it, it's going to take a whole lot of time, right? And then as Ernest said, even if we did do it, and we took up all that time, it might give us totally the wrong answer because random validation sets are inappropriate for our problem. Okay, So I'm not going to be spending much time on cross-validation because I just I think it's an interesting tool to have. Uh, it's easy to use. SKLearn has a cross-validation thing you can go ahead and use, um, but uh, it, it's 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 not that often that it's going to be an important part of your toolbox, in my opinion. It'll come up sometimes. Okay, so that is uh, validation sets. So then the other thing we uh, started talking about um, last week, uh, and got a little bit stuck on because I screwed it up, was a tree interpretation. Um, so I'm actually going to cover that again um, without the error um, and dig into it in a bit more detail. So uh, can anybody tell me what tree interpreter does and how it does it? Anybody remember? It's a, it's a difficult one to explain. I don't think I did a good job of explaining it. So. Don't worry if you don't do a great job, but does anybody want to have a go at explaining it? No? Okay, that's fine. So um, <clears throat> let's start with the output of tree interpreter. So if we look at a single model, a single tree, in other words, here is a single tree. Okay. And so to remind us, the top of a tree is before there's been any split at all. So 10.189 is the average log price of all of the options in our training set. So I'm going to go ahead and draw right here. 10.189 is the average of all. Okay. And then if I go a couple of system less than or equal to 0.5, 
then I get 10.345. Okay, so for this subset of 16,800, cut for is less than or equal to 0.5, the average is 10.345. And then of the people with uh, a couple of system less than or equal to 0.5, we then take the subset where enclosure is less than or equal to 2, and the average there of log sale price is 9.955. So here's 9.955. Okay. And then final step in our tree is model ID, just for this group, with no capital system, with enclosure less than or equal to 2, then let's just take model ID less than or equal to 45.73, and that gives us 10.226. Okay? So then we can say, alright, starting with 10.109189, average for everybody in our training set, for this particular tree's subsample of 20,000. Adding in the coupler decision for coupler less than or equal to 0.5 increased our prediction by 0.156. So if we predicted with a naive model of just the mean, it would have been 10.109, uh, adding in just the coupler decision would have changed it to 10.345. So this variable is responsible for a 0.156 increase in our prediction. From that, the enclosure decision was responsible for a minus 0.395 decrease, the model ID was responsible for a 0.276 increase, until eventually that was our final decision, that was our prediction for this auction of this particular sale price. So we can draw that as what's called a waterfall plot. Right? And waterfall plots are one of the most useful plots I know about, and weirdly enough, there's nothing in Python to, to do them. And this is one of these things where there's this disconnect between like the world of like management consulting and business, where everybody uses waterfall plots all the time, and like academia, uh, who have no idea what these things are. But like every time like you're looking at, say, um, here is last year's sales for Apple, and then there was a change in that iPhones increased by this amount, Macs decreased by that amount, and iPads increased by that amount. Every time you have a starting point in a number of changes and a finishing point, waterfall charts are pretty much always the best way to show it. So here, our prediction for price based on everything, 10.189, there was an increase, blue means increase, of 0.156 for coupler, decrease of 0.395 for enclosure, increase model ID, of 0.276, so decrease, sorry, increase, decrease, increase to get to our final 10.266. So you see how a waterfall chart works? So with Excel 2016, you, it's built in, you just click insert waterfall chart, and there it is. Um, if you want to be a hero, uh, create a waterfall chart um, a package for Matplotlib, put it on pip, and everybody will love you for it. Um, there are some like really crappy Gists and manual notebooks and stuff around. These are actually super easy to build. Like you basically do a stacked column plot where the the bottom of this is like all white, right? Like you can kind of do it, but if you can wrap that up all and put the data, the points in the right spots and color them nicely, that would be totally awesome. I think you've all got the skills to do it and would make you know be a terrific thing for your portfolio. Um, so there's an idea. Uh, could make an interesting cattle kernel, even. Like, here's how to build a waterfall plot from scratch, and by the way, I've put this up on PIP, you can all use it. Um, so in general, therefore, obviously, going from the all, and then going through each change, then the sum of all of those is going to be equal to the final prediction. So that's how we could say, if we were just doing a decision tree, then you know, you're coming along and saying like, how come this particular auction was this particular price, and it's like, well, or your prediction for it, and like, oh, it's because of these three things had these three impacts, right? So for a random forest, we could do that across all of the trees, right? So every time we see coupler, we add up that change. Every time we see enclosure, we add up that change. Every time we see model, we add up that change, okay? And so then we combine them all together, we get what? Tree interpreter does, right? So you could go into the source code for tree interpreter, right? It's, it's not at all complex logic, or you could build it yourself, right? And you can see uh, how it does exactly this. 
So when you go tree interpreter dot predict with a random forest model for some specific auction, so I've got a specific row here. This is my zero index row. Um, it tells you, okay, this is the prediction, the same as the random forest prediction. Bias. This is going to be always the same. It's the average sale price for for everybody uh, for each of the random samples in the tree. And then contributions is the average of, or sorry, the total of all the contributions for each time we see that specific column appear in a tree. Right? So um, last time I made the mistake of not sorting this correctly. So this time uh, np.argsort is a super handy um, function. It sorts, it doesn't actually sort contribution zero, it just tells you where each item would move to if it were sorted. So now by passing IDXS to each one of um, the column, um, the, uh, the level, um, contribution, uh, I can then print out all those in the right order. So I can see here, here's my column, uh, here's the, uh, the level, uh, and the contribution. So the fact that it's a small version of this piece of industrial equipment meant that it was less expensive. Right? But the fact that it was made pretty recently meant that it was more expensive. The fact that it's pretty old, however, made that it was less expensive. Right? So this is not going to um, really help you much at all with like a Kaggle style situation where you just need predictions. But it's going to help you a lot in a production environment or even pre-production. Right? So like something which any good manager should you should do if you say here's a machine learning model I think we should use. Is they should go away and grab a few examples of actual customers or, or actual auctions or whatever and check whether your model looks intuitive, right? And if it says like, my prediction is that, um, you know, uh, uh, lots and lots of people are going to really enjoy um, this crappy movie, you know, and it's like, well, that was a really crappy movie, then they're going to come back to you and say like, explain why your model's telling me um, that I'm going to like this movie because I hate that movie. And then you can go back and you say, well, it's because you like this movie and because you're this age range and you're this gender. On average, actually, people like you did like that movie. Okay, yeah. Uh, uh, what's the second element of each tuple? Um, no, um, this is saying for this particular row, uh -huh. it, it was a mini. And it was 11 years old, got it. and it was a hydraulic excavator track, three to four metric tons. Yeah, got it. Thank you. So it's just feeding back and telling you it's it because this is actually what it was. It was these numbers. So I just went back to uh, the original uh, data to actually pull out the the descriptive versions of each one. Okay. So if we sum up all the contributions together and then add them to the bias, then that would be the same as adding up those three things, adding it to this, and as we know from our waterfall chart, that gives us our final prediction. Um, this is a almost totally unknown technique, and this um, particular uh, uh, library is almost totally unknown as well. Um, so like it's a great opportunity to you know show something that a lot of people like it's, it's totally critical in my opinion um, but but rarely known. So that's um, that's kind of the end of the random forest interpretation piece and hopefully you've now seen enough that when somebody says we can't use modern machine learning techniques because they're black boxes that aren't interpretable. You have enough information to say you're full of shit, right? Like they're extremely interpretable, and the stuff that we've just done, you know, trying to do that with a linear model, good luck to you. You know, even where you can do something similar with a linear model, trying to do it so that's not giving you totally the wrong answer, and you had no idea it was the wrong answer, is going to be a real challenge. So. The last step we're going to do before we try and build our, our own random forest is deal with this tricky issue of extrapolation. So in this case, um, if we look at our tree, 
Um, let's look at the accuracy of our most recent trees. Um, we still have, uh, you know, a big difference between our validation score and our training score. Um, the actually in this case it's not too bad. The the uh, the difference between the OOB and the validation is actually pretty close. Um, so if there was a big difference between validation and OOB, like I'd be very worried about that we've dealt with the temporal side of things uh, correctly. Um, let's just have a look at I think our most recent model. Ah, uh, here it was. Yeah. So there's a tiny difference, right? And so on on Kaggle. At least you kind of need that last decimal place. Uh, in the real world, I'd probably stop here, um, but quite often you'll see there's a big difference between your validation score and your OOB score, and I want to show you how you would deal with that. Um, particularly because actually we know that the, the OOB should be a little worse because it's using less, less trees, so it gives me a sense that we should be able to do a little bit better. And so the reason, we, the way we should be able to do a little bit better is by handling the time component a little bit better. Um, so ex here's the problem with random forests when it comes to extrapolation. Um, when you when you've got a data set that's like you know four, got four years of sales data in it, and you create your tree, right? And it says like oh if these um, if it's in some particular store and it's some particular item and it is on special. You know, here's the average price, right? It actually tells us the average price, you know, over the whole training set, which could be pretty old, right? And so, when you then um, want to step forward to like, well, what's going to be the price next month? It's never seen next month, and and where else with a kind of a linear model, it can find a relationship between time and price, where even though we only had this much data. When you then go and predict something in the future, it can extrapolate that. But a random forest can't do that. There's no way, if you think about it, for a tree to be able to say, well, next month it would be higher still. So there's a few ways to deal with this, and we'll talk about it over the next couple of lessons. But one simple way is just to try to avoid using time variables as predictors if there's something else we could use that's going to give us a better uh, you know something of a kind of a, a stronger relationship that's actually going to work in the future so in this case what I wanted to do was to first of all figure out um, what's the difference between our validation set and our training set like if I understand the difference between our validation set and our training set, then that tells me what are the predictors which which have a strong temporal component, and therefore they may be irrelevant by the time I get to the future time period. So I do something really interesting, which is I create a random forest where my dependent variable is is it in the validation set. Right, so I've gone back and I've got my whole data frame with the training and validation all together, and I've created a new column called is valid, which I've set to one, and then for all of the stuff in the training set, I set it to zero. Right, so I've got a new column which is just is this in the validation set or not, and then I'm going to use that as my dependent variable and build a random forest. So this is a random forest, not to predict price. That predict is this in the validation set or not, and so if your variables were not time dependent, then it shouldn't be possible to figure out if something's in the validation set or not. This is a great trick in Kaggle, right? Because in Kaggle, um, they often won't tell you whether the test set is a random sample or not. So you could put the test set and the training set together, create a new column called is test, and see if you can predict it. If you can, you don't have a random sample, which means you have to come and figure out how to create a validation set from it, right? And so in this case, I can see I don't have a random sample because my validation set can be predicted with a 0.9999 R squared, 
And so then if I look at feature importance, the top thing is sales ID. And so this is really interesting. It tells us very clearly sales ID is not a random identifier, but probably it's something that's just set consecutively as time goes on. We just increase the sales ID. Sale elapsed, that was the number of days since the first date in our data set, so not surprisingly that also is a good predictor. Interestingly, machine ID, uh, clearly each machine is being labeled with some consecutive identifier as well. And then there's a big, don't just look at the order, look at the value. So 0 0.7, 0 0.1, 0 0.07, 0 0.002. Okay, stop, right? These top three are hundreds of times more important than the rest, right? So let's next grab those top three, right? And we can then uh, have a look at their values, um, both in the training set and in the validation set. And so we can see, for example, sales ID on average is uh, divided by a thousand, on average is 1.8 million uh, in the training set and 5.8 million in the validation set, right? So you, like, you can see, just confirm, like, okay, they're very different. So let's drop them. Okay, so after I drop them, let's now see if I can predict whether something's in the validation set. Oh, I still can with 0.98 R squared. Um, so once you remove some things, then other things can like come to the front, and it now turns out, okay, that's not surprisingly, age, you know, things that are old are, um, you know, more likely, I guess, to be in the validation set, because if, you know, earlier on in the training set, they can't be old yet. Um, year made, same reason. Uh, so then we can, um, um, uh, try removing those as well. Um, and so once we, let's see, where do we go here? Yeah, so what we can try doing is we can then say, all right, let's take the sales ID, sell that's machine ID from the first one, uh, the age, year made, sale, sale day of year from the second one, and say, okay, these are all uh, time-dependent features. Um, so, I still want them in my random forest if they're important, right? But if they're not important, then taking them out, there are some other non-time dependent variables that, that work just as well. That would be better, right? Because now I'm going to have a model that generalizes over time better. So here I'm just going to go ahead and go through each one of those features and drop each one one at a time. Okay? Retrain a new random forest and print out the score. Okay, so before we do any of that, our score was 0.88 for our validation versus 0.89 OOB. And you can see here, when I remove sales ID, my score goes up. And this, this is like what we're hoping for. We've removed a time-dependent variable. There were other variables that could find similar relationships without the time dependency. So removing it, caused our validation to go up. Our OOB didn't go up, right, because this is genuinely, statistically, a useful predictor, right? But it's a time-dependent one, and we have a time-dependent validation set. So this is like really subtle, but it can be really important, right? It's trying to find the things that give you a, a generalizable time across time prediction, and here's how you can see it. So, by, so it's like, okay, we should remove sales ID for sure, right? But sale elapsed, didn't get better. Okay, so we don't want that. Machine ID did get better, went from 888 to 893. Right, so it's actually quite a bit better. Um, age got a bit better. Year made got worse. Sale day of year got a bit better. Okay, so now we can say, all right, let's get rid of um, the three uh, where we know that getting rid of it actually made it better. Okay, and as a result, look at this, we're now up to 915. Okay, so we've got rid of three time-dependent things, and now, as expected, our validation is better than our OOB. Okay, so that was a super successful approach there, right? And so now we can check the feature importance. And let's go ahead and say, all right, that was pretty damn good, let's now leave it for a while, so give it 160 trees, uh, let it churn on it, and see how that goes. Okay.
And so, as you can see, like we did all of our interpretation, all of our fine tuning, basically with smaller model subsets, and at the end we ran the whole thing. It actually still only took six, 16 seconds. Um, uh, and so we've now got an RMSC of 0.21. Okay, so now we can check that against Kaggle. Uh, again, we can't. We uh, unfortunately this um, older competition we're not allowed to enter anymore to see how we would have gone. So the best we can do is check uh, whether it looks like we would have done well based on our validation set. Um, so it should be in the right area. And yeah, based on that we would have come first. Okay, so you know I think this is an interesting. Series of steps, right? So you can go through the same series of steps in your Kaggle projects uh, and more importantly your real-world projects. So one of the challenges is once you leave this learning environment, suddenly you're surrounded by people who they never have enough time, they always want you to be in a hurry, they're always telling you, you know, do this and then do that. You need to find the time to step away, right, and go back because this is a genuine real-world modeling process you can use. And it gives, when I say it gives world-class results, I, I, I mean it, right? Like this guy who won this, uh, Lustigos, sadly he's passed away, um, but he is the uh, top Kaggle uh, uh, competitor of all time. Like he, uh, he won, I believe, like dozens of competitions. So if we can get a score even within Kui of him, then we are doing really, really well. Um, Okay, so let's take a five-minute break, and we're going to come back and build our own random forest. Uh, I just wanted to clarify something quickly. A uh, very good point during the break was um, uh, going back to the change in R squared between here. And here, it's not just due to the fact that we uh, removed um, these three predictors. Um, we also went reset RF samples, right? So to actually see the impact of just removing, we need to compare it to um, the final step earlier. So it's actually compare it to 907. So removing those three things took us from uh, 907 to. Nine one five. Okay, so I mean, and you know, in the end, of course, what matters is our final model. But uh, yeah, just to clarify. Okay. So um, some of you have asked me about writing your own random forests from scratch. I don't know if any of you have given it a try yet. Um, my original plan here was to do it in real time, and then as I started to do it, I realized that that would have kind of been boring because for you, because I screw things up all the time, so instead we might do more of like a, a, a walk through the code together. Um, just as an aside, um, this reminds me, talking about the exam, actually somebody asked on the forum about like what, what can you expect from the exam. The basic plan is to make it a, uh, the exam be very similar to these notebooks. So it'll probably be a notebook that you have to, you know, get a data set, create a model, train it, feature importance, whatever, right? And the plan is that it'll be open book, open internet, you can use whatever resources you like. So basically if you're entering competitions, the exam should be very straightforward. Uh, I also expect that there will be some pieces about like, here's a partially completed random forest or something, you know, finish, finish writing this step here, or here's a random forest, uh, implement feature importance, or you know, implement one of the things we've talked about. So it'll be, you know, the, the exam will be much like what we do in class and what you're expected to be doing during the week. Uh, there won't be any uh, define this or tell me the difference between this word and that word or whatever. There's not going to be any rote learning. It'll be entirely like, are you an effective machine learning practitioner? I.e., can you use the algorithms? Uh, do you, you know, can you create an effective validation set? Uh, and can you can you create parts of the algorithm? Implement them from scratch. So it'll be all about writing code, basically. So uh, if you're not comfortable writing code to practice machine learning, then you should be 
practicing that all the time. If you are comfortable, you should be practicing that all the time also. Whatever you're doing, write code to implement random to do machine learning. Um, okay. So I I kind of have a particular way of um, writing code, uh, and I'm not going to claim it's the only way of writing code, but it might be a little bit different to what you're used to, and hopefully you'll find it at least interesting. Um, creating, implementing random forest algorithms um, is actually quite tricky. Not because the code's tricky. Like generally speaking, most random forest algorithms are, pr are pretty conceptually easy. You know that. Generally speaking, um, academic papers and books have a, a knack of making them look difficult, um, but they're not difficult conceptually. What's difficult is getting all the details right and knowing and knowing when you're right. And so, in other words, we need a good way of doing testing. So, uh, if we're going to re-implement something that already exists, so like say we wanted to create a random forest in some different uh, framework, different language, different operating system, you know, I would always start with something that does exist, right? So in this case, we're just going to do as a learning ex exercise, writing a random forest in Python. So for testing, I'm going to compare it to an existing random forest implementation. Okay, so that's like critical. Anytime you're doing anything involving like non-trivial amounts of code in machine learning, knowing whether you've got it right or wrong is kind of the hardest bit. Uh, I always assume that I've screwed everything up at every step, and so I'm thinking like, okay, assuming that I screwed it up, how do I figure out that I screwed it up, right? And then much to my surprise, from time to time, I actually get something right, and then I can move on. Okay? But most of the time I, I, I get it wrong. Uh, so unfortunately with machine learning, there's a lot of ways you can get things wrong that don't give you an error. They just make your result like slightly less good. Uh, and so that's that's what you want to pick up So given that I want to kind of compare it to an existing implementation I'm going to use our existing data set our existing validation set and then to simplify things. I'm just going to use uh, two columns um, to start with So let's go ahead and start writing a random forest so my way of writing nearly all code is top-down just like my teaching and so by top-down I start by assuming that everything I want already exists, right? So in other words, the first thing I want to do, I'm going to call this a tree ensemble, right? So to create a random forest, the first question I have is, what do I need to pass in, right? What do I need to initialize my random forest? So I'm going to need some independent variables, some dependent variable, pick how many trees I want. Uh, I'm going to use the sample size parameter from the start here. So how big do you want each sample to be? And then maybe some uh, optional parameter of what's the smallest leaf size. Okay. Um, for testing, it's nice to use a constant random seed. So we'll get the same result each time. So this is just how you set a random seed. Okay. Um, maybe it's worth mentioning this for those of you that aren't familiar with it. Random number generators on computers aren't random at all. They're actually called pseudo random number generators. And what they do is given some initial starting point, in this case 42, a pseudo random number generator is a mathematical function that generates a deterministic, always the same, sequence of numbers, such that those numbers are designed to be as uncorrelated with the previous number as possible, okay? uh, and as unpredictable as possible. And as uncorrelated as possible with something with a different random seed. So the second number in in the sequence starting with 42 should be very different to the second number starting with 41. And generally they involve kind of like taking you know uh, uh, you know using big prime numbers and uh, taking mods and stuff like that. Um, it's kind of an interesting area of math. Um, if you want real random numbers, the only way to do that is that you can actually buy hardware called a hardware random number generator that will have inside them like a little bit of some radioactive substance and and like something that detects how many things it's spitting out or you know there'll be some hardware thing getting current um, system time is is it a valid 
random, like random number generation process. So that would be for maybe for a random seed, right? So this thing of like, what do we start the function with? So one of the really interesting areas is like in your computer, if you don't set the random seed, what is it set to? And um, yeah, quite often people use the current time for security. Like obviously we use a lot of random number stuff for security stuff. Like if you're generating an SSH key, you need some. It needs to be random. Um, it turns out like you know people can figure out roughly when you created a key. Like they could look at like oh IDRSA has a timestamp, and they could try you know all of the different nanoseconds starting points for a random number generator around that time step and figure out your key. So in practice, um, a lot of like really random, um, uh, high randomness requiring applications actually have a step that say, please move your mouse and type random stuff at the keyboard for a while. And so it like gets you to be a source, it's called entropy, to be a source of entropy. Um, other approaches is they'll look at like, you know, the hash of, of some of your log files. Or you know um, stuff like that. Uh, it's a really really fun area. Uh, so in our case, our purpose actually is to remove randomness. So we're saying, okay, generate a series of pseudo random numbers starting with 42. So it always should be the same. Um, so uh, if you haven't done much stuff in Python OO, this is a basically standard idiom. At least I mean I write it this way. Most people don't. But uh, if you pass in like uh, one, two, three, four, five things that you're going to want to keep inside this object, uh, then you basically have to say self.x equals x, self.y equals y, self.sample equals sample. Right? And so we can uh, assign to a tuple uh, from a tuple. So, you know, again, this is like my way of coding. Most people think this is horrible, but I prefer to be able to see everything at once. And so I know in my code, anytime I see something that looks like this, it's always all of the um, stuff in the method being set. If I did it a different way, then half the codes now come off the bottom of the page and you can't see it. So, all right. So, um, so that was the first thing I thought about was like, okay, to create a random forest, what information do you need? Uh, then I'm going to need to store that information inside my object. And so then I need to create some trees. Right? A random forest is something that creates some, is something that has some trees. So I fi basically figured, okay, list comprehension to create a list of trees. How many trees do we have? Well, we've got n trees, trees. That's what we asked for. So a range n trees gives me the numbers from zero up to n trees at minus one. Okay. So if I create a list comprehension that loops through that range, calling create tree each time, I now have n trees, trees. And now, so I, I to write that I didn't have to think at all. Like that's all like obvious. And so I've kind of delayed the thinking to the point where it's like, well, wait, we don't have something to create a tree. Okay, no worries. But let's pretend we did. If we did, we've now created a random forest. Okay, we'd still need to like do a few things on top of that. Uh, for example, once we have it, we'd need a predict function. So okay, well let's write a predict function. How do you predict in a random forest? Can somebody tell me, uh, either based on their own understanding or based on this line of code, what would be like your one or two sentence answer? How do you make a prediction in a random forest? Uh, Pastor Spencer? Uh, you would want to, over every tree for your, like the row that you're trying to predict on, Average the values that your that each tree would produce for that. Uh, exactly that good. And so you know uh, that's a summary of what this says, right? So for a particular row, right, or maybe this is a number of rows, um, go through each tree, calculate its prediction. So here is a list comprehension that is calculating the prediction for every tree for x. I don't know if x is one row or multiple rows. It doesn't matter, right? Uh, uh, as long as as long as tree dot predict works on it, and then once you've got a list of things, uh, a cool trick to know is you can pass numpy dot mean a, a regular non numpy list, okay, uh, and it'll take the mean. Uh, you just need to tell it axis equals zero means uh, average it across the lists, okay. So this is going to return the average of dot predict for each tree, and so. I find list comprehensions 
allow me to write the code in the way that my brain works. Like you, you could take the words Spencer said and like translate them into this code, or you could take this code and translate them into words like the one Spencer said, right? And so when I write code, I want it to be as much like that as possible, right? I want it to be readable. And so hopefully you'll find like when you look at the fast AI code and you're trying to understand well how did Jeremy do X? I try to write things in a way that you can read it and like kind of turn it into English in your head. So if I say correctly, that predict method is recursive. It's called... no, it's calling tree dot predict, and we haven't written a tree yet. So self dot trees is going to contain a tree object. So this is tree ensemble dot predict. And inside the trees is a tree, not a tree ensemble. So this is calling tree dot predict, not tree ensemble dot predict. Good question. Okay, so we've nearly finished writing our random forest, haven't we? All we need to do now is write create tree, right? So um, based on this code here, or on your own understanding of how we create trees in a random forest, can somebody tell me? Um, let's take a few seconds, have a read, have a think, and then I'm going to try and come up with a way of saying how do you create a tree in a random forest? Okay, who wants to tell me? Anybody else? Uh, okay, let's. Tyler's got close to the mic. Uh, you take your. Um, you, you're essentially taking a random sample or of the original data, and then you're just. Get, just constructing a tree, however that happens. So construct a decision tree, like a non-random tree, from a random sample of the data. Okay. So again, like we've delayed any actual thought process here. We've basically said, okay, we could pick some random IDs. This is a good trick to know. Um, if you call np .random permutation passing in an int. It'll give you back a randomly shuffled sequence from zero to that int, right? And so then, if you grab the first colon n items of that, that's now a random subsample. So this is not doing bootstrapping. We're not doing sampling with replacement here, um, uh, which I think is fine. You know, for my random forest, I'm deciding that it's going to be something where we do subsampling, not bootstrapping. Okay, so here's a good line of code to know how to write uh, because it, it comes up all the time. Like I find in machine learning, most algorithms I use are uh, somewhat random, and uh, so often I need some kind of random sample. Can you pass that, Tyler or Chen Shi? Uh, won't that give you one one extra? Because the you said it'll go from zero to length. Um, no, so this will give you if lin self dot y is of size n, this will give you n uh, a sequence of length n, so zero to n minus one. Okay. And then from that, I'm picking out colon self dot sample size, so the first sample size IDs. Uh, I have a comment on bootstrapping. I think this method is better because we have chance of uh, giving more weight. To each observation, or am I thinking wrong? No, I mean I, th I think you, for bootstrapping, we could also give weights. No, I mean, uh, weighing uh, single observations more than they are like without wanting that weight, because when bootstrapping with re replacement, we can have a single observation and duplicates of it in yeah. the same tree. Yeah, which will give it does feel weird, but I mm -hmm. think. I'm not sure that the actual theory or empirical results backs up our intuition mm -hmm. that it's worse. Um, it would be in interesting to look to look back at that, actually. Um, I, personally, I prefer this because I feel like most of the time we have more data than we want to put in a tree at once. I feel like back when Bryman created Random Forests, it was 1999. It was kind of a very different world, you know, where we pretty much always wanted to use all the data we had. Um, but nowadays, I would say that's Generally, not what we want. Um, we normally have too much data, and so what people tend to do is they'll like fire up a Spark cluster and they'll run it on hundreds of machines. When 
it makes no sense because if they had just used a subsample each time, they could have done it on one machine. And like the the overhead of like Spark is a huge amount of I/O overhead. Like I know you guys are doing distributed computing now. If you if you've looked at some of the benchmarks, yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, if you do something on a single machine, it can often be hundreds of times faster um, because you don't have all this 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 I/O overhead. It also tends to be easier to write the algorithms, like you can use like sklearn, um, easier to visualize, uh, cheaper, so forth. So like I almost always avoid distributed computing, and I have my whole life. Like even 25 years ago when I was starting in machine learning, I you know still didn't use clusters because I, I always feel like whatever I could do with a cluster now, I could do with a single machine in five years' time. So why don't I just focus on always being as good as possible with a single machine, you know, and that's going to be more interactive and more iterative and um, work for me. So, uh, okay, so um, so again, we've like delayed thinking um, uh, to the point where we have to write decision tree, and so hopefully you get an idea that this top-down approach, the goal is going to be that we're going to keep delaying thinking so long that that we delay it forever. Like, like eventually we've somehow written the whole thing without actually having to think, right? And that's that's kind of what I need because I'm kind of slow, right? So this is why I write code this way. And notice, like, you never have to design anything. You know, you just say, hey, what if somebody already gave me the exact API I needed? How would I use it? Okay, and then and then okay to implement that next stage, what would be the exact API I would need to implement that? Right? And you keep going down until eventually you're like, oh, that already exists. Okay, so uh, this assumes we've got a class called decision tree, so we're going to have to create that. So a decision tree uh, is something. So we we already know what we're going to have to pass it because we just passed it, right? So we're passing in um, a random sample of x's, a random sample of y's, um, uh, Index is, is actually um, so we know that down the track. So I'm, I, I, I've got to plan a tiny bit. We know that a decision tree is going to contain decision trees, which themselves contain decision trees. And so as we go down the decision tree, there's going to be some subset of the original data that we've kind of got. And so I'm going to pass in the indexes of the data that we're actually going to use here. Okay. So initially, it's the entire random sample, right? So I've got the whole. Let's see, Daisy. I've got the whole range, uh, and I turn that into an array. So that's zero. The index is from zero to the size of the sample, and then we'll just pass down the min leaf size. So everything that we got for constructing the random forest, we're going to pass down to the decision tree, except of course num trees, which is irrelevant for the decision tree. So again, now that we know that's the information we need, we can go ahead and store it inside this object. Um, so I'm pretty likely to need to know uh, how many rows we have in this tree, which I generally call n. Uh, how many columns do I have, which I generally call c. So the number of rows is just equal to the number of indexes we are given, and the number of columns is just like however many columns there are in our independent variables. Um, so then we're going to need this value here. We need to know for this tree uh, what's its prediction, right? So the prediction for this tree is the mean of our dependent variable for those indexes which are inside this part of the tree, right? So at the very top of the tree, it contains all the indexes, right? I'm assuming that by the time we've got to this point, remember, we've already done the um, random sampling, right? So when we're talking about indexes, we're not talking about the random sampling to create the tree. We're assuming this tree now has some random sample. Inside decision tree, this is this is the, the, one of the nice things, right? Inside decision tree, the whole random sampling thing's gone, right? That was done by the random forest, right? So at this point, we're building something that's just a plain old decision tree. It's not in any way a random sampling anything. It's just a plain old decision tree, right? So the indexes is literally like which subset of the data have we got to so far in this tree? And so at the top of the decision tree, it's all the data, 
right? So it's all of the indexes, okay? So all of the indexes, uh, so this is therefore all of the dependent variable that are in this part of the tree, and so this is the value, mean of that. Does that make sense? Anybody got any questions about about that? So uh, yes, can you pass to Chen Shi? Actually, just to let you know that a large portion of us don't have a OOP, I mean OOP experiments. Okay, yeah, sure. Just to let so, um, so a quick, so a quick OOP primer would be helpful. Great. Yeah. Okay. Um, who has done object-oriented programming in some programming language? Okay. Um, So you've all used actually lots of object-oriented programming in terms of using existing classes, right? So every time we've created a random forest, um, we've called the random forest's constructor, and it's returned an object, and then we've called methods and attributes on that object. So fit is a method, you can tell because it's got parentheses after it, right? Or else, um, yeah, OOB score is a, a, a property uh, or an attribute, doesn't have parentheses after it. Okay, so inside an object, there are kind of two kinds of things. There are the, the functions that you can call. Um, so you, you, you have object dot function parenthesis arguments, or there are the properties or attributes you can grab, which is object dot and then just the attribute name with no parentheses. So when uh, and then the other thing that we do with objects is we create them. Okay, we pass in the name of the class and it returns us the object, and you have to tell it all of the parameters necessary to con to get constructed. So let's just copy this code. And see how we're going to go ahead and build this. So the first step is we're not going to go m equals random forest regressor. We're going to go m equals tree ensemble. We're creating a class called tree ensemble, and we're going to pass in various bits of information. Okay, um, so maybe we'll have ten trees, uh, sample size of a thousand. Maybe a min leaf of three, right? And you can always like choose to name your arguments or not. So when you've got quite a few, it's kind of nice to name them so that just so we can see what each one means. It's always optional, right? Um, so we're going to try and create a class that we can use like this, and then um, I'm not sure we're going to bother with dot fit um, because we've passed in the x and the y. Right, like in, in Scikit-learn, they use an approach where first of all you construct something without telling it what data to use, and then you pass in the data. Uh, we're doing these two steps at once. We're actually passing in the data, right? And so then after that, we're going to be going m dot. So we're going to go preds equals m dot predict, passing in maybe some validation set. Okay, so we're, that's that's the API we're kind of creating here. So this thing here is called a constructor. Something that creates an, an object is called a constructor. Uh, and Python, um, there's a lot of ugly, hideous things about Python. One of which is they it uses these special magic method names. Underscore underscore in it underscore underscore is a special magic method that's called that's called when you try to construct a class. So when I call tree ensemble parenthesis. It actually calls tree ensemble dot. People say dunder in it. I kind of hate it, but anyway, dunder in it, double underscore in it, double underscore dunder, dunder in it. Um, so that's why we've got this method called dunder in it. Okay, so when I call tree ensemble, it's going to call this method. Another hideously ugly thing about Python's OO is that there's this special thing where if you have a class and to create a class you just write class in the name of the class um, all of its methods uh, automatically get sent one extra parameter one extra argument 
which is the first argument. And you can call it anything you like. If you call it anything other than self, everybody will hate you and you're a bad person. Okay? So call it anything you like, as long as it's self. Okay. So, um, so that's why you always see this. And in fact, I can immediately see here, I have a bug. Anybody see the bug in my predict function? I should have self, right? I, I, like, I always do it, right? So anytime you try and call a method on your own class and you get something saying you passed in two parameters and it was only expecting one, you forgot self, okay? Uh, so like this is a really dumb way to add OOP to a programming language, but the older languages like Python often did this because they kind of needed to, they started out not being OO and then they kind of added OO uh, in a way that was hideously ugly. So Perl, um, which predates Python by a little bit, kind of, I think really came up with this approach and unfortunately other languages of that era stuck with it. Um, so you have to add in this magic self. So the magic self now, um, when you're inside this class, you can now pretend as if any property name you like exists. So I can now pretend there's something called self.x. I can read from it, I can write to it, right? But if I read from it and I haven't yet written to it, I'll get an error. So the stuff that's passed to the constructor gets thrown away by default. Like there's nothing that like says you need to re this class needs to remember what these things are. But anything that we stick inside self is remembered for all time. You know, as long as this object exists, you can access it, it's remembered. So Now that I've gone, um, in fact, let's do this, right? So let's let's create the tree ensemble class, and let's now instantiate it. Okay. Uh, of course, we haven't got X. Uh, we need to call X train Y train. Okay. Decision tree is not defined, so let's. Create a really minimal decision tree. There we go. Okay, so here is enough to actually instantiate our tree ensemble. Okay, so we've defined the init for it. We've defined the init for decision tree. We need decision trees in it to be defined because inside our ensemble init it called self .create tree, and then self .create tree called the decision tree constructor. And then decision tree constructor basically does nothing at all other than save some information, right? So at this point, we can now go m dot. Oh, sorry. Okay, and if I press tab at this point, can anybody tell me what I would expect to see? Pass it to Taylor. Chen Shi, could you pass that to Taylor? Um, we would see like a we would see a drop down of all available methods for that class. Okay, which uh, would that, be uh, in this case. So if M is a tree ensemble, we would have create tree and predict. Okay. Anything else? Um, would it, what? Oh yeah, and as well as Ernest whispered the variables. As well, uh, yeah. So the the so variable could mean a lot of things. We'll so say the attributes. Yes. So the things that we put inside self. So if I hit tab, right there they are. Right as Taylor said, there's create tree. There's predict, and then there's everything else we put inside self, right? So if I look at uh, m dot min leaf, if I hit shift enter, what will I see? Yeah, the number that I just put there, I put min leaf is three, so that went up here to min leaf. This here is a default argument, so it says if I don't pass anything, it'll be five, but I did pass something, right? So it's three, self dot min leaf. Here is going to be equal to min leaf here. Okay. So something which, uh, like, because of this rather annoying way of doing OO, it does mean that it's very easy to accidentally forget to do that, right? So if I don't assign it to self dot min leaf, right, then I get an error. And so here, tree ensemble doesn't have a min leaf. Right? So how do I create that attribute? I just put something in it. Okay, so if you want to like, if you don't know what a value of it should be yet, but you kind of need to be able to refer to it, you can always go like self dot min leaf equals none, 
right? So at least there's, there's something you can read, check for nonness, and not have an error. Okay. Great. Now, interestingly, I was able to instantiate tree ensemble even though predict refers to a method of decision tree that doesn't exist. And this is actually something very nice about the dynamic nature of Python, is that because it's not like compiling it, it's not checking anything unless you're using it. Right? So we can go ahead and, and create decision D dot predict later, and then our, our instantiated object will magically start working. Right? It doesn't actually look up that functions, that methods details until you use it. And so it really helps with top-down programming. Um, okay, so when you're inside a class definition, in other words, you're at that indentation level, you know, indented one in, so these are all class definitions, uh, any function that you create, unless you do some special things that we're not going to talk about yet, um, is automatically a method of that class. And so every method of that class magically gets a self passed to it. Uh, so we could call, since we've got a tree ensemble, we could call m.createTree, and we don't put anything inside those parentheses, because the magic self will be passed, and the magic self will be whatever m is. Okay, So m.createTree returns a decision tree, just like we asked it to. right? So m.createTree.idxs will give us the self.idxs inside the decision tree. Okay, which is set to np.arrange range self.sample size. Right. Um, why as data scientists do we care about object-oriented programming? Um, because a lot of the stuff you use is going to require you to implement stuff with OOP. For example, every single PyTorch model of any kind is created with OOP. It's the only way to create PyTorch models. Um, good news is, um, what you see here is the entirety of what you need to know. So you, this is all you need to know. You need to know to create something called init, to assign the things that are passed to init to something called self, and then to stick the word self after each of your methods. Okay, and so the nice thing is like now to think as an OOP programmer is to realize you don't now have to pass around x, y, sample size, and min leaf to every function that uses them. By assigning them to, to attributes of self, they're now available like magic. Right? So this is why OOP is super handy. If you're particularly, I started trying to create a decision tree initially without using OOP and try to like keep track of like what that decision tree was meant to know about was very difficult, you know, or else with OOP you can just say inside the decision tree, you know, self.index is equals this and everything just works. Okay, okay, that's great. So we're out of time. I think that's um, that's great timing because there's an introduction to OOP, but this week, you know, next class I'm going to assume that you can use it, right? So you should create some classes, instantiate some classes, uh, look at their methods and properties, uh, have them call each other and so forth until you feel comfortable with them. And maybe um, for those of you that haven't done OOP before you, and find some other useful resources, you could pop them onto the wiki thread so that other people know what you find um, useful. Great! Thanks everybody!